Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're at. Um, welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're going to get started here in just one more minute, um, giving folks a little bit more time to join. Okay, I think we've hit the magic number. So a uh, couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get started. We do have live transcription, also known as closed captioning, that should be available. Um, and one of the icons at the bottom of your screen. Also down there, you will find the Q&A function. And that is a great place to go to ask any questions if you have te technical difficulties. And also, we greatly encourage you to ask questions for any of the presenters as we go along, and then we will answer those toward the end. The chat function today is um, view only, and you will be seeing links to resources there. So that is a good place to keep an eye out for. And um, the attendees are in listen only mode. So, um, please use that Q&A function. In case you miss anything, we'll be sending each registered participant a link to the recording, and it will also be available on Zero Breast Cancer's YouTube channel and on our website. So let's start out by finding out who is here today. Uh, we've got a poll, there it is. Please check, uh, choose all that apply here from this relatively long list. Oh, and it says hosts and panelists cannot vote, darn. Okay, finishing up. Okay, we should have. Um, I'm not seeing the results. Leanna, are those? There we go. Okay, so more than half of the people here identify as public health workers and professionals. Um, we also have about a quarter of participants, either themselves or a family or friend um, has, family member or friend has cancer. So it looks like a good, um, a good mix. And then we have one more poll for you before we get started. So we would like to know what it is that you are most interested in today. And again, you can choose more than one. About done. Okay. And wow, um, I think people are in the right place. How culture affects breast cancer treatment and outcomes. And then also a lot of people want to know about how it affects health and health care in order to help our communities. So wonderful. Okay, let's get started then. Welcome to the third in Zero Breast Cancer's Advancing Health Equity and Breast Cancer webinar series. Thank you for joining us. And today we're going to discuss culture and breast cancer, overcoming unequal obstacles. My name is Catherine and Thompson, and I will be moderating today. I want to start out by acknowledging that Zero Breast Cancer office and staff are located on Ohlone, Pomo, Wapo, and Coastal Miwok 
tribal territories. We name these tribes to protect and honor the peoples of these places where we work and live. And we hope that you will also consider land acknowledgement as a way to um, stand in solidarity with these and other native tribes and nations. So for those of you who are not familiar with zero breast cancer, 25 years ago, it was uh, started by a group of otherwise healthy women who had breast cancer, and they gathered around a kitchen table and started on a quest to find out why they got the disease. A big reason for this was to ultimately protect their daughters, their nieces, and future generations. ZBC focuses on the many things that we can control that impact our risk of cancer. And um, that includes systemic issues that affect our health. So it's not just our individual behaviors. We recognize there's a need to address social problems, unfair practices, and unjust conditions that weaken the health of specific Americans more than others. So health equity requires providing support to overcome unhealthy conditions and barriers to health that affect some groups more than others. And health is not just an absence of disease. It's also the physical, psychological, social, economic, and spiritual well-being. Culture is a very broad term, and it is shaped by many things, where and how we grew up, race, ethnicity, language, geography, disability, gender, and sexual orientation. What is normal, what is right or wrong for each of us depends on all of these factors. And there's a lot of intersections, so we are um, shaped by multiple things. Healthcare systems also have cultures. They have ideas of what is normal. So a healthcare provider may assume certain things are normal. And they often expect us to disclose things. So they want um, to hear what our concerns and our emotions are in spoken English. And of course, we also disclose our bodies. Often they assume that we live with a nuclear family and healthcare providers are frequently seen as authority figures and um, who may or may Healthcare systems and our U.S. society in general often blame health problems on the individual or on their culture. A person who smokes or is overweight, for example, is often told to just change their behavior, to stop smoking or eating certain foods. However, if um, I if, uh, live in a place where um, tobacco and fast food industries are heavily marketing then um, those are the messages I'm constantly receiving, and that is going to impact my health, my behaviors. Whole groups are often also blamed to explain inequities. And um, one example of that is banks giving subprime loans, more subprime loans to Blacks and Latinos. Um, and that partly explains why people of color are more likely to live in low-income neighborhoods and why those neighborhoods stay and then are affected by the marketing of uh, tobacco and fast food. So zero breast cancer works to improve health equity throughout the cancer continuum. And we work with communities to develop culturally appropriate education campaigns. On this screen, you can see examples of our Tagalog Healthy Activities booklet and the postcard advertising our English, Spanish, and Chinese videos for kids and their parents to be healthy. We also have bilingual materials that were co-created by survivors, uh, breast cancer survivors and scientists that are um, on topics chosen by lower income and multilingual survivors. And these we freely share with partner organizations like support groups. So that's just one example of how that is done. Now we're going to hear from others who have uh, expertise in actually reaching specific communities. I am very happy to, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce all three at once. 
We have Ana Napoles. She's the scientific director of the National Institute of Minority Health and Disparities, part of the National Institutes of Health. And I have had the privilege of working with Anna when she was here at the University of California, San Francisco, where she um, did research and interventions and worked in a collaborative with us on breast cancer survivors. Um, we also have Ricky Farley, who is one of those amazing people who turned her breast cancer diagnosis into a new life. She co-founded an organization called Touch, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance, and um, co-hosts The Doctor Is In, a podcast series to help to address the unique disease that is black breast cancer. And then finally, we'll hear from Lei Chun. She's the health educator at San Francisco's Chinatown Public Health Center, where for 30 years, even though she looks so young, she has been creatively working with people with cancer that are Chinese speaking. Um, I also have had the uh, honor of working with her on her shared passion for improving the lives of breast cancer survivors and advocating for those with fewer resources. So um, Anna, I will stop sharing if you wanna go ahead and take it away. Thank you, I'll, I'll, um, let me just get my screen set up and share my screen. I'm sorry, when I, um, I have to share the first, otherwise it does strange things. Oh, beautiful. Just, I'm trying to get um, set up here. Okay, is that good? Whoops. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Hello everyone and thank you very much, Catherine, for inviting me to be uh, on this, uh, in this important panel and also very, um, very credible and well-seasoned panel. <laughs> so, and I mean that in a very positive way. Uh, I think we've all been working in our respective communities for a long, long time. And uh, we have many lessons we've learned along the way, thanks to our communities. And uh, it's a privilege to share some of that here with all of you today. Um, I am at uh, in Bethesda, but I spent over 27 years in the San Francisco Bay Area working with a number of uh, communities, Latino communities throughout California on issues of uh, needing services for psychosocial support uh, for Spanish speaking Latinas with breast cancer in both rural and urban communities of California. So the inequity we were trying to address was uh, that we know there's a, that Latino women, especially Spanish speaking women experience poor quality of life. And so we, we've done an, a, a lot of research, including qualitative interviews in depth interviews with uh, Latina cancer survivors, uh, their, their providers with oncology social workers and so forth to get a really good profile of what the needs of Latinas are with breast cancer, especially those who who are Spanish speaking. And um, much of what we learned is listed here and uh, reinforced by uh, what they've told us, which once they get the cancer diagnosis, many will react uh, and think it's a life, life uh, or death sentence, right? That um, they are uh, facing potentially uh, death and those fears of death and recurrence are very real. They worry very much about their families and what's gonna to happen to their families. And they protect their families because uh, it's part of their role as, as the mother uh, uh, or the caregiver in the family. And they feel a tremendous loss of control because they're not able to access uh, understandable information in Spanish about their condition, about what to expect about their treatment. They tend to experience more symptoms uh, such as pain and fatigue and body image issues, and they have a uh, worse quality of life overall. So all of that uh, is just to point out that they have a great need for these symptom management and psychosocial support programs. 
And another con huge contributor for those that are Spanish speaking or limited English speaking in general is that many don't understand their diagnosis and treatment. You know, they, they are faced with medical jargon. Many times they see a provider and uh, try to get by with limited English skills or their providers try to get by without a professional interpreter. Um, there's evidence that they're less involved in patient-centered decision-making. So, and we know from the science, the scientific evidence that being involved in your treatment and your decision-making, treatment decision-making is associated with better outcomes and better, uh, higher patient satisfaction. And so they're left with a lot of uncertainties and doubts. Did I pick the right treatment? You know, will, did I make a mistake? Will I have good outcomes? And how will I manage the long-term symptoms that I'm feeling? And so with that, as I mentioned, we looked at the community locally and we, we connected with Carmen Ortiz, who's a, a Puerto Rican um, clinical psychologist in San Francisco. Many of you may know her. Uh, she works at and founded Ciclo de Vida, a cancer support group to serve Latinos who speak Spanish. And then we, we identified a best practices model, Las Angelitas, that she had there were uh, some of her women who had participated in her, in her um, support groups and showed uh, some leadership uh, capabilities, then went on to provide one, -on, were trained to provide one-on-one -on -one support for newly diagnosed Latinas at San Francisco General Hospital. And so we also looked at the scientific evidence and found uh, some programs that we knew were effective in reducing uh, psychological distress after cancer, as well as stress levels in general and uh, learned about what coping skills helped in terms of managing stress. And then we, as I mentioned, we did a lot of interviews and also went back and forth in iterative uh, consultations with our community advisory board. And so we, we, the intervention consisted of coping skills training and social support directly from a cancer survivor like them. We hope that that training in how to manage the stress and the information on cancer and the emotional support would lead to a more a, a sense of empowerment, right? That they would have the skills necessary to be able to manage their cancer symptoms, to ask their providers questions about their treatment, and that they would feel like they had someone who was supporting them because oftentimes they wouldn't turn to their families because uh, they wanted to protect their families. And so we hope that this would improve quality of life and, and reduce anxiety and depression. And so what the program offered was it offered uh, cancer information in Spanish, these stress management techniques, which are called cognitive behavioral stress management techniques. So it's changing your positive, your negative thinking into positive thinking, learning how to do the, beha the behavioral aspects, which are the um, guided imagery, the deep breathing and so forth. We taught them how to ask questions, how to ask for help in their, uh, their support system. And then they received, as I mentioned, the one-on-one -on -one support from a breast cancer survivor like them, a Latina who had had breast cancer. And then they learned how to manage those emotions and set goals for themselves. And so it was offered by compañeras, we call them, which means companions. The program was called Nuevo Amanecer, which means a new dawn. And uh, they met once a week for 10 weeks in their homes um, with this compañera who provided them a structured program in Spanish with videos and it was all free of charge, of course. And so we also wanted just as well to build capacity within the community to provide these types of programs. So we trained the recruiters, the people that would go out into the community and find uh, women for our studies, as well as the interventionists. So they learned uh, how to train others and other survivors, other newly diagnosed women and longer term survivors to provide the training um, and share the materials with them. So they became an expert at stress management skills and uh, providing emotional support. And so this is a quick summary of our findings. We had two randomized trials, one in urban Latinas in five counties in Northern California. And the second trial was in rural longer term survivors in um, Imperial Valley, which is on the border with Mexico, in uh, Visalia, which is in the Central Valley and in the Salinas uh, Watsonville area as well. 
So what we found, as you can see here, just a quick overview, is that it improved quality of life, physically and emotionally aspects in the overall quality, quality of life. It, it decreased their symptoms and their concerns about their cancer, their depressive symptoms, bodily symptoms. It improved their awareness of tension, their ability to ask for support, and their ability to cope um, and their confidence in coping with uh, anything, any stressful situation that they would face in life. And so it really prepared them long-term for uh, managing stress. And then it was reflected in a decrease in their anxiety and uh, bo bo body symptoms. And so this was just a testimonial from one of our participants in the study. And she said, the program changed me because it put me in higher spirits made me happier and helped me think positive thoughts so I could push forward and fight. So it was really that ability to feel like they were in control and had skills to really master some of the challenges of being faced with, with cancer. And so we translated this in another study um, just to show you the potential of using technology along with some telephone coaching by, uh, by community-based uh, people. And um, we, we tried this where it was a two month pilot study with Spanish speaking Latinas. And so what it was, it was this um, emotional support and really access to some of the cancer information and how to manage symptoms, as well as uh, it was connected to a Fitbit. We gave them a Fitbit, encouraged them to walk to prevent recurrence and improve uh, their, their emotional well being as well. And within two months, we found really striking results. Um, that uh, it improved their levels of fatigue, their, it reduced their health distress and improved their emotional well-being. They uh, felt that they were more knowledgeable about their follow-up care and resources, how to manage their, their um, necessary follow-up exams and so forth. And then it also, they were able to increase their average daily steps by uh, 1300 steps. So it just shows you the power of these, uh, of blending the technology, and in this case, a low cost telephone intervention to give people tools, especially vulnerable communities and really uh, reaching out to them and making something, um, you know, pre-testing everything and make sure, making sure it's adaptable and acceptable and that they're able to use it and will use it. And so uh, what we demonstrated through these series of studies it, is that it is possible to reach the very vulnerable but resilient communities. And so when we were writing these grants, it took a long time to get funded. And a lot of the comments that we got from reviewers is you'll, you'll never be able to maintain these people in studies because they're so critical, especially when they're newly diagnosed. And what we found, you know, looking at our sample is about 80, 75 to 80% had faced uh, really tremendous financial hardship in the past year. So we're talking about a low, low income communities. Um, almost 85% had less than a high school education. They were all Spanish speaking. And we had retention rates at three months and six months that were over 90% and up to 95%. So we showed that it can be done and that women want these services, they wanna participate and um, that, that it's feasible and doable. And so I think the implications for us as uh, providers in our communities and, um, and also people that work with uh, community health workers and so forth, or if we are community health workers, that there's a great and a tremendous capacity within the community and that these, these communities are hungry for the information and willing to support and help. And many, we just trained people from the community who wanted to help and give back the women who had been diagnosed. And that's what was so heartwarming about it, that they gained a lot from these experiences as well as the women they reached out to and, and provided information to. And that translating these interventions can help address these high cancer symptom burdens, right? The disparities in, in poor quality of life and also the you know the less engagement, the lower levels engagement in their in their own care and decision making. We empower them to be more proactive. They empower themselves to be more proactive, to ask questions of their providers, to ask their family members for help when they when they need it. And we also demonstrated, I think, through these series of studies that trained community health workers 
can provide this level of training, right? These evidence-based programs and therefore help us address the shortages because we know that there are only so many oncology social workers and, and um, other folks who are trained to, to and speak the language and know the culture. And so the more that we can extend um, these types of services and infuse them in community and take um, and build on community resources, the more people who need these services we can reach. So I just wanna thank you and um, provide here our webs. There's a website we establish. All our materials for our program are there. Everything you would need to deliver the program, including the videos and materials for the um, person providing the program, as well as a participant, and all of our uh, research study questionnaires and everything else publications are up there, so you can see uh, the science behind it as well. So I thank you for uh, for your attention and um, and look forward to any questions. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. Thanks. And that uh, link is in the chat box too. So folks will have um, access to that. Uh, Ricky? How is everybody? Sure? Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Sharing my screen. So I'm going to take another, a different angle, actually, and um, talk about African American women. So my the the focus of my foundation is on eradicating Black breast cancer. And what do I mean by Black breast cancer? You know, I I believe that Black women have a different disease. Our mortality rate is 42 percent higher. We have a 39% higher recurrence rate. Um, black women with breast cancer have a 71% higher risk of death. And black women under 35 get breast cancer at twice the rate, die at three times the rate. And I believe it's a lot to do with, you know, there are a lot of psychosocial factors. And of course my dog is barking now, psychosocial factors. But I believe there's some biological factors that we haven't identified yet because we don't really have the science. And why don't we have the science? We don't have the science because the participation rate is only 3% for black women in clinical trial research. So we really don't know whether the drugs work or not. Um, I'm, I'm an almost 10 year survivor and I had triple negative breast cancer, which black women get at 2.3 times the rate. Um, and I'm a miracle. I don't know, you know, the drugs work for me but they don't always work for a lot of black women. And so I really tried to focus on bringing science to the breast cancer conversation and try to figure out how we can engage more black women in the clinical research that we need. So we have a lot of work to do here because there are a lot of barriers and we know the psychosocial barriers, the social determinants of health, transportation, access to care, all those things. But I think it's deeper than that. I think it's somewhat emotional. And I'm not a scientist, I'm a marketing person. I've had a 30 year career really trying to understand why, you know, why people do the things they do, how they behave, how they, they behave and how, to, how, to, how they perceive things and also convincing them to probably buy products that they don't really need or want. I worked for Coke for many years and I probably gave a lot of people diabetes and, and um, obesity and cavities. But anyway, so I'm trying to change, turn those my sort of marketing skills into how I can help with the health messaging. Because I believe the messaging about clinical trials is missing the mark. And despite a lot of effort by a lot of people with really good intentions and a lot of money, we are not reaching these women with a message that compels them to engage in research. So I created this project a year ago and we've been working diligently to, towards this end. It's really, it's called Black Data Matters, but it's really how do we empower patients to change how they think about research and engage in research. So we've completed the first phase of this research. Um, and I have um, some great partners in the study with me, Morehouse School of Medicine, breastcancer.org, the Center for Healthcare Innovation, Citizen, and Susan Komen Foundation. I know that I can't do this work alone. It's a huge challenge and so, I brought in some partners into my sandbox to help us find these answers. 
So what were our research goals? We really wanted to kind of increase our participation, as I've said, to advance the science and hopefully save lives by getting the drugs that we need made. Um, we also want to disrupt how the breast cancer ecosystem engages black women. Like, what are you saying? What are you doing? What are we doing differently? Because right now we're all spinning wheels, getting, getting nowhere at a 3% level. And hopefully this will get us to health equity for black women who are diagnosed or at risk for breast, breast, breast cancer and help them get the best care we can give them. So our research really tries to confirm all those tactical barriers that we know about, transportation, lack of access to good care, um, not being asked by the doctor about a trial, um, not living in the right neighborhood and just sort of fears and measure the impact of what people really know about, about um, breast cancer research, the placebo myth, um, do they understand standard of care? Um, unpacking all the sort of ramification, ramifications of medical research and really uncovering those emotional barriers that are preventing black women and creating fear for them to get involved in trials. We also want to kind of get the get the messaging right. What are they understanding from the messaging that sits in front of them currently and how do we need to change it to get them to, to understand and engage in trials and then get over the barriers participation. So a lot of research has been done over the years. So what was different about our approach? Our approach was different because um, we designed the study to really look at the emotional barriers and the cultural barriers, as we spoke about earlier, the cultural barriers around black women's resistance to clinical trials. So towards that end, we held very intimate conversations moderated by me, a black breast cancer survivor. Um, and I'm a you know, pretty outspoken advocate in the community and I realized not, not even knowing going into this, the power of the voice that I really have in the community, the power of the voice of a breastie. So what was different about it is we had interviewed 48 women and, um, and we had a bunch of focus groups, 14 focus groups and six individual interviews to, to get to 48 women that were either having have breast cancer now, survivors, family members or people at risk. And it was all ages, all stages of breast cancer. And the frightening thoughts are here. Um, what we learned in the research, and this is all qualitative now, um, which we're now validating with a quant, but um, don't do a clinical trial. You will get the sugar pill and die. So it was pretty crazy to hear that. We clearly knew going in that there were a lot of education opportunities that people don't really understand the logistics and the mechanics and just how a clinical trial actually works. But when you hear a breastie say to another breastie, don't do a clinical trial, you're gonna get the sugar pill, was really scary. So not only was the, um, what we learned was that black women, um, of course, don't trust the medical system. They don't trust their doctors. They don't trust pharmaceutical companies, but who do they trust? They trust the voice of another breastie. The breastie club is not one that you want to be in, but once you're in it, there's unconditional love, unconditional trust, and you will believe whatever a breastie tells you. I get many phone calls from new, new patients on a regular basis, and they'll often call me and say, okay, Ricky, the doctor said, do this, take this chemo, do whatever, but what do you think? And I always say, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I can tell you five stories of someone who took that drug. I can pass you on to these five breasties who did that therapy. And that is the voice of trust. So when you, when the people that you trust are giving you bad information, then it's not a good place to be. And what we learned, so in this learning, we learned that not only are we um, breasties a, a credible voice or the most credible voice, but that a lot of them are giving the wrong information. And we really have to uncover that, understand that, and then educate them with the information they need and arm them with the knowledge that they need to pass on the right information. So some of the pictures here is, you know, I don't wanna be a guinea pig. I don't wanna get the sugar pill. I don't wanna be a laboratory experiment. And I would only do a clinical trial as a last resort when I think I'm gonna die, which are all things that are not true and not valid. And the breasties are the ones passing that message on. Um, this is just a quote and, and I'm not gonna read it. You guys can read it, but basically, they don't trust doctors. They don't feel like the doctor's hearing them, right? And the doctors aren't getting, you know, understanding what they really need to hear about a clinical trial. We also found that 
in um, that a lot of times they aren't even approached with a clinical trial opportunity by the doctor. And maybe when they are, it's possibly when they're first diagnosed. Guess what? You have breast cancer, but also do you want to do a clinical trial in the same breath? And that's just not appropriate, not appropriate timing. I feel like a lot of the research is not with black women. So if I had someone who went through it already, I trust their pain and feedback. Again, the value of a breastie. But the good news, and there is really good news here, there is hope that with the culturally relevant, with, with the right educational messaging, with the right stimuli, with the right visuals, I can get a perception shift. And I learned that in the research because on a scale of one to five, one meaning I will never do a trial, to five, sign me up today, I could get patients from a one to at least a four and even a five in five minutes with the right information. In five minutes, coming from me, the breasty, the voice of credibility, but I would say stuff like basic, basic things, explaining what standard of care means, but also saying, you know that, that chemo that you took for your breast cancer, guess what? In your body, it was a clinical trial. You didn't know if it was gonna work. The doctor didn't know if it was gonna work. You know, we have some data about it, but you're taking a risk. So you did a clinical trial even with the treatment that you did. Or guess what? That Advil that you took last week for a headache, that was in a clinical trial. Wow, they didn't know that. Or that Tylenol that you gave your baby for a fever last week, that was in a clinical trial. In fact, anything on the shelf at CVS was in a clinical trial. So that just basic, basic information. Or you know what? Black women who to take care of everybody, you know, I'll give you my last piece of chicken, I'll take care of anybody that I love. You won't necessarily do it for yourself, but do it for your daughter. Do it for your granddaughter. Do it for somebody that you love. And all of these messages are resonating with these women. So right now we're we're kind of validating what are the what are the key messages and how can we get her? But when you tell her basic, basic, basic things, you know, if your doctor gave you a sugar pill, he would be under the jail. You know, that they can't do that anymore. It's illegal. So just by giving them basic information. We can get them to sign up and change their perception. So that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, um, Ricky. Okay, I'll stop. Okay, uh, we're about out of time, so. No problem. So much work to do. Thank you. Oh, you bet. There is so much to do. And, um, Please uh, write those questions into the Q&A function and um, Ricky will have a chance to, to tell us more about the messaging that was working and all. Um, next up, Lei Chun. Hi, yes, um, it's my turn. So uh, let me share my screen. All right. Okay, I'm just trying to start from the slide. Oops. Oh, I always have that issue sometimes. Okay, so thank you, Catherine, um, for the invitation to the Zero Breast Cancer webinar. I'll share a little bit about some of the culture, how the Chinese culture impact breast cancer in the Asian American community and some of the efforts that we have done to overcome the barriers and obstacles. Asian American and cancer. For Asian American, it is the only racial group where cancer is the leading cause of death. Language is a barrier for monolingual Chinese speaking cancer survivors. And that's the group that I have been working with for the past 30 some years. And um, it is a big stigma in our community. As most of you know, it's also a stigma in other communities too. When someone is diagnosed with cancer, they view that as a death sentence and, um, and because of that, it prevents them from sharing with others. Sometimes they see me on the street in Chinatown, they might not say hi to me. And it also prevents them from receiving support that is so much needed. As a result, we promote loneliness and isolation. So we know that it's a need for this patient-centered, culturally and linguistically appropriate care for Asian American living with cancer. So my work at the Chinatown Public Health Center, which is a primary care clinic in the San Francisco Department of Public Health, 
I've been there for 30, year, 30 plus years. And over the years, the health center uh, has developed several programs and I want to share a few of them with you. So most of them uh, have been around Chinese Women Cancer Support Group. They did some quilt making. They actually have published two publications to share about their cancer stories. We also have developed a cancer survivors peer support program, um, kind of matching uh, veteran cancer survivors with newly diagnosed cancer, cancer patients to provide some emotional support on the telephone. This is a publication that they have been involved in um, 2016. Um, it is a, um, a, a storybook of uh, 24 cancer survivors. They shared um, uh, one or two photos that they have taken and then they wrote their story of living with cancer. It's based on the photo voice concept that using um, a camera and take photos and then to capture some of the uh, cancer experience to identify issues. Um, in coping and living with cancer. We then held a press conference um, and a celebration event. And I think a few of you in the audience might have attended that event um, back in five years ago. And um, so it was nice in terms of uh, sharing the storybook with the participants in the community, newly diagnosed uh, survivors, and also um, it's bilingual. So the providers can actually share it with their patients. This is a photo taken by this 68-year-old uh, uh, cancer survivor called Ching. Um, so she is also a 10 years uh, endometrial cancer survivor. She shared about how she felt when she was first diagnosed with cancer. And this is uh, what she wrote in her story. I felt just like this swan, all curled up in this world at the edge of the lake without love and care from friends and families. She happened to be um, uh, living by herself in this country. So she was from mainland China. So in her story, she wrote that she felt lonely, depressed, and isolated. She advocated for more in language services and support for women living with cancer. So this story uh, book is online and I just want to thank Liana so for putting this link in the chat room. She actually wrote, she was very thankful that about all the work of the health center as well as Z San Francisco General Hospital, um, the services that they have provided for Chinese speaking patients. And they, she hoped that more people can benefit from these programs. This is um, our Chinese Women Cancer Support Group. And this is um, actually the first support group in the country that is started for Chinese speaking, monolingual Chinese speaking women with cancer. And it was started 27 years ago. And the woman described the support group as coming home, a place where they can freely talk about their fears, their concerns and their hopes without judgment. So you see that the top picture is our first hour time when we get together and we do check in. They, uh, we have, it's an open group. So we invite new people and as well as veterans. So we actually have one veteran who had been with our group from the beginning, 27 years ago. And uh, people really look up to her for hope and inspiration, you know, because she has survived her cancer for the past 27 years. So during the, uh, sec during the break, You'll see on the picture on the left, um, usually led by a support group member, they do these 18 steps of Tai Chi together um, during the break. And, and then the second hour, we usually spend some time doing some discussions on topics like nutrition. Uh, we might teach them some relaxation uh, skills, meditation skills, or even do art projects. So this is a picture of them doing an art project, cutting out images from magazines and put them all together. The theme is around three wishes. So they were sharing what their wish. Uh, they get better, uh, they want to travel, they want to spend time with families. So then this uh, activities uh, really open up their hearts so that they can um, really feel supported and, 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 um, and, and, and share um, with each other. So this is the support group piece. Um, the, I mentioned earlier that we uh, have, in addition to these, our voices, the, the book, our voices, members of the support group also created two cancer quilts and a publication called Our Stories 
Okay, so am I still on? I think I am. Yeah. So the first quilt, they name it the to nurture self is to create new life is in Chinese also on the quilt. This idea of making quilt is actually brought on by the single survivor in the uh, member in the group who have done quilts in the uh, HIV community. So she shared this idea with us. So each woman did a piece and uh, and we sold it together. So Sarah Chin, uh, she on behalf of the support group, she received a hope award um, at, from the um, uh, intercultural cancer conference a, a while ago. Um, our second quilt is called Our Stories. It features another 24 stories of women living with cancer and their experience. Their stories really represent their struggles, their courage, their strength and hope in survivorship. They have risen above the stigma of cancer, fear and isolation and have found ways to use voices and stories to express and heal themselves. So you might have seen some of our quilt in cancer conferences. Um, that's my job. I bring these to the mainstream and let them know about the work of our Chinese uh, women in our support group. A quick evaluation of, um, of the impact of the Chinese women cancer support group. You have seen that here, these are uh, over 85% of um, the participants in this group that they self-reported improvements um, after six months of uh, being part of the support group, improved in their self-esteem, emotional managed skills, uh, outlook on life and stress management skills. And then 83% uh, said they no longer felt isolated. Okay. Well, now I just have one more two, one or two slides on the meeting the COVID pandemic challenges, you know, because of the pandemic 15 months ago, everything stopped. Like we have no more um in person support group meetings and um people were faced with these challenges including for the asian community a lot of activities on anti-asian violence but people were really fearful especially the elderly they won't want to leave their house um they feel very isolated and the lack of support um, from the system, like including the in-home support service worker cannot come and uh, help them, disruption of services, even our staff navigators in our hospitals, because we are part of the public health system, we got deployed, and so the service become very limited in the public health system, uh, medical care delays, um, many of them might not be getting their annual mammogram, um, because of the disruption of services. And even now we noticed that when we were slowly reopening our clinic, people feel that they, they just too scared, you know, to come out on their own. So limited technology also um, limit them, you know, teaching them how to access Zoom has been a big challenge and a lot of hand holding. So some patients don't want to come back to see, um, to see of doctors, so we are trying to use Zoom, but many of them actually do not know how to access Zoom to do these clinic visits on the video. There's a big study that was just published by Asian American Health Forum on, um, so she, thank you, uh, Liana, for sharing that link. It's a national survey of uh, uh, 1,550 English-speaking Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders on COVID-19, it showed that 35% of the uh, community members said their mental health had deteriorated um, since the beginning of the pandemic. And 25% uh, said their physical health has also deteriorated since the beginning of the pandemic. So plus all the activities with anti-Asian violence in this country, 70% 70, 70 of the AA and HPI think discrimination against their community has become more common in the US than it was before COVID-19, as you have seen on videos. 49% reported, re reported that they, their family member also experienced discrimination since the pandemic began. So since my time is limited, I can just quickly tell what we are doing now during the pandemic, we have been, um, making telephone calls, by weekly telephone calls to each of the uh, 90 uh, people, women in our, in our uh, cohort. And um, we also offer them some peer support, like matching some uh, trained volunteers to uh, 
call the newly diagnosed uh, cancer women to provide emotional support on the phone. Um, so we started the Zoom meeting. So it was a lot of work and um, the, the community used a different social media called WeChat. And I can share more later if we have questions about how to use WeChat to communicate with the monolingual Chinese speaking women. But just the support group, we keep on adding people. Every time when we call them, we say, oh, can we teach you how to use Zoom? Can, you, can we uh, show you step-by-step step how to do it? So right now we have, Started with a few, now we have 45 people on the uh, support group. Um, we chat um, the, the Zoom meeting, uh, assume the Zoom, I guess the group, I should say. And we do a lot of resource referrals about where you can get free food, the pop up pantries from Food Bank, they can go and pick up some um, groceries. Okay, thank so you. I thank you. I'm done. So, okay, just quickly, I want to show that one of the favorite activities of our Chinese women is doing line dances. So, this is just a nine second demo. <laughs> thank you so much, Lei Chun. Um, I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, okay, I'll stop share sharing. My... Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right. So one of the things that um, is really important for us at Zero Breast Cancer, and obviously with all of these groups, oops, I wasn't supposed to start at the beginning again. Here we go. Um, is to um, share ideas for how we can actually make a change. So we want to um, I keep going back to the beginning. So we want to um, talk now about some of the things that we can do. Before we go, um, dive into the discussion, um, I wanted to share some of the ideas that we have here. And we would love to hear some of your ideas as well. Um, so we have this blog from Christine Janelle, and she shared her story about um, breast cancer and um, how it was different because of ableism and racism, and so those cultures that she belongs to. We also have this wonderful multicultural community advisory board for a study that we are involved in on survivorship. Um, so we would love to hear uh, thoughts about what it is that you think is important. We've got one more polling question to ask uh, about what cultural issues in your community are, do you think are the most important? And uh, in the Q&A, we would also love to get your ideas about uh, things to add to this list, ways that we can help to make change together. And we know we cannot do this alone. So that's why we come together in webinars like this. Okay, great. So, ah, patient navigation is very big. That happens to be one that's very close to my heart. Um, I am a big advocate for that as a policy. And that's something that um, Lei Chun and Anna and I have all worked on a bit together. Um, if the panelists could all go ahead and turn on their videos again, uh, that would be great. Um, and again, this was all that applies, so making sure that we have appropriate social support, educational materials, um, a lot of important um, elements. So, great. Um, there is a question, I have a question for the group, and then we have a couple of questions on the Q&A. Um, I'm wondering for programs like Nuevo Amanecer, 
and the Breasties and the Chinatown Cancer Support Group, um, you know, we try to reach out to these groups and we get oftentimes kind of a biased sample because the people who are aware of our groups, who are seeking information. So how do you try to be um, as inclusive as, as possible and reach people who may not um, be uh, looking for these services, looking for these programs? Um, Lei Chen, if you could um, turn your video back on too. Thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts? Um, for the Chinese media, you know, I think for the Chinese community, people um, use a lot of media, like even Chinese radio um, or Chinese television now. So I was thinking, you're right, Catherine, <laughs> when we reach out to a support group, they are already uh, very uh, motivated, right? So that they come out to our support group, right? There are many who are not even um, um, uh, joining a group. So... I was thinking maybe uh, using some of the media, uh, like like a twenty second um, PSA to promote such a program or their services available or even clinical trials. I think can be a good way. I found that very effective actually. Great, Anna, do you have something? Um, I would just say it's pers personal outreach. You know, it's 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 by from trusted people from the community that that's what makes a difference. And people from the community um, know how to reach, how to find people. You know, people uh, and how to communicate effectively with them. And um, you know, and and then people are willing to come in on, on their own terms, right? In their own due time. I think you have to give people the space to uh, to also take in what you're what you're extending, right? What you're offering, and then and then um, once they have the information, they can make a decision for themselves whether to avail themselves of those services. But it is, you know, it's really working. You know, the communities know. I think the trusted leaders, the trusted um, advocates, know how to reach the community members. I would ditto that and say it's just having a relevant voice, you know, and really understanding the patient and, and listening and having a but having a relevant message that that works for them that's culturally relevant. I agree with that. I think that also works. You know, I uh, sometimes know even members of a support group when they go to treatment in radiation or the clinics, they met other women, then they tell them about the support group so that personal outreach and contact are very important. And from the Q&A, we have a question for Ricky that is kind of related. Um, what method is best to embed into clinical trial presentations by a hospital system? Is it a community navigator or other? I think the navigator is really important, but it's really seeing somebody that looks like me and, um, you know, I think in the ideal world, if you could have a breasty navigator, how cool would that be? Like our co-founder, Valerie Worthy, she's a, um, she's a navigator at Duke Medical Center, Duke Cancer Center. But I think it's, it's um, having someone who looks like me, who maybe has a shared experience or who, you know, can understand who I am and listen to me. So, and take the fear away. Um, in my ideal world, you know, would be, somebody that looked like me that was in a Victorian house that gave me a blanket that she made or a cup of tea that she, you know, she made the mint, you grew the mint in her garden and turned on Luther Vandross and gave me the shot. So making it relevant to me and what I need, which is hard in the hospital. But. Um, we have some things in the chat, some more resources. Um, and as we go ahead and wrap up, um, I do have one more question. Um, one of the things that we sometimes uh, struggle with when we're trying to create, for example, Spanish language or Chinese language materials is uh, having the right um, uh, di dialect, basically. So, you know, there are so many different kinds of Spanish and China, even if people speak Mandarin, 
um, it's a huge country and there are differences. So um, how do you make sure that materials are relevant to as many people as possible? I would say I always believe in pre-testing, right? I mean, I think in Spanish, there's like a universal Spanish that um, that people acknowledge and, you know, we call it broadcast Spanish, you know, so it's what people in the media use. And, um, you know, literacy is also, you know, what level, you know, avoiding jargon, all those things are really critical. But um, bottom line, it's, you know, engage your community in the development of the materials, right? Because they'll be able to tell you whether uh, a particular term doesn't fit their context. Um, and then you make it real and you make it um, fit that context, right? So then we need to multiple people, not just have, you know, two Spanish speakers, but maybe six or eight from different places, different ages. Right, translation is a team event. <laughs> It's a team yeah. sport. <laughs> Material development definitely is a, is a team event. Right. <laughs> like I would suggest usually if there's funding to develop Chinese material, if you can have a team of three or four people, one speak um, Mandarin from mainland China, Putonghua, and one speak Mandarin from Taiwan and one from Hong Kong, like I, I come from Hong Kong myself. So it's like, like a team that so that we can actually discuss and fight over <laughs> translation terms and agree on one that fit everyone. So they understand even the word screening, screening is used differently um, in the actual characters um, among the Chinese in China versus the Chinese in Taiwan. Yeah. so. That team approach, I think, is the best. And also look at, oh, what Chinese newspapers are they reading? You know, like some cater to what's more from the Cantonese speaking, some cater with the Mandarin speaking. So um, so considering that uh, in terms of what, what, what are your target audience is very important, right? Maybe the younger, the younger generation now, actually a lot of them are all Mandarin or Putonghua from mainland China. In, 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 the, in the chat, um, Ivo Sampaio wrote, um, and I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but team effort um, was also with a variety of ages and education, as well as ethnicities. And um, I find that that is often true with images and things like that as well. Um, Ricky, do you have experience, I mean, with your marketing background, you must be a total pro at that kind of thing. Um, do you use different images when you're trying to get like a younger audience or um, one that maybe it has, you know, is, is more um, health literate than another? Um, yes, definitely. The imagery is really important. You know, again, patients want to see themselves and, and to the language point, they want to hear themselves. So when you see something that doesn't look like you, you know, you're not as relevant. And I think it depends on how, you, you know, what the materials are, how they're presented. But, um, and I don't know a lot about, about um, Chinese marketing, but I know for Hispanic marketing, which I've done a bunch of, you know, we kind of have what we call Walter Cronkite Spanish, you know, that's not always relevant. But again, if you can make it relevant to a population, to a geography, to a cultural group, then it's, it's more, you know, it hits home, you know, again, it's again, I want to see and hear me and what you're telling me, you know, make it, make it like me. And that's how, you know, kind of what's in it for me as a patient. So I'm going to connect more effectively if I, if I, if you get me as a marketer, as a communicator, as an, as an educator, as a physician, whatever, I want you to get me. I want you to understand where I'm coming from and talk to me in the way I need to be talked to. Right. Great. And I know that we're pretty much at time. Um, so I'm just gonna take two more minutes to um, ask a couple more questions. Um, but I do want to ask people if you would please fill out our post webinar survey so that we can get your input for our future webinars. And we do have another webinar coming up um, in the fall that will be about um, 
it will be about environmental health and how that impacts uh, breast cancer risk. So the exposures that we have. And I really want to thank our presenters and our sponsors. And also, of course, we have ways that you can connect with Zero Breast Cancer to hear about our upcoming events. And we will also be including information from our uh, partner agencies, which we consider all of you on our website. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, Ivis writes, ladies, thanks for a great job. Um, another person wrote, I heard the percentage of breast cancers increasing within the Asian communities surpasses other races. Is that correct? Um, I do not believe that is the case, at least in the state of California data or the national data that I have seen more recently. That may be the case in some place. Um, it may be increasing more right now, but I, um, does anybody have any thoughts about that before we close? I don't know. Actually. Yeah, I, I just know that um, I just know that cancer is the leading cause of death. You know, compared to the mainstream, mainstream we um, the leading cause of death is heart disease, but for the Asian American community, it is cancer. And of course, there's a lot of uh, disparity um, differences be among the various thirty to forty groups of Asian um, Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Yeah. Sorry, Anna. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, that I I have not seen those statistics that you know, but it could, but the the rates do vary. Make the same point. You, you, it depends on your country of origin, and and you know, it's pretty well established that the longer you're in the U.S., the the higher risk you become uh, for cancer. So your risk, and you know, nobody really knows why, but a lot of it could be exposure to fast food and but environmental factors and so forth, but um, just something to keep in mind. And not and lump people to, together, right? Not lump populations mm -hmm. together. Yeah. yeah. Desegregation is one of our goals among the um, a, uh, NHPI communities. Yeah. Desegregation of data is very important. Right, right. As Ricky mentioned earlier too, age is a difference. So um, among younger um, African-American black women, um, breast cancer is uh, the, uh, much more prevalent. So they have the, um, that group has the highest rate of incidence there. And then uh, white women still have, it's the last I've seen, um, higher rates. But then when you look at individual types, like you said, the way you slice and dice it, so people who have triple negative are much more likely to be black. Um, and it, yes, it varies. <laughs> it's a um, very complex. We have a lot of all of the stats about black women on our website at touchbbca.org. Why is black breast cancer different? So if you go to our Touch BBCA website, you'll, um, you can find the data about black women. And some of those sources, probably, if you go to the sources, you can probably find, you know, all of the all of the racial um, breakouts. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again very much. It was a pleasure to have you here today. We learned so much and we ha will have the recording of today's session available. Um, and we hope that you will continue to uh, work on these issues that you are doing such a great job on. Um, thanks all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bless you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bless. Be safe. Yep. Yeah.